Hello and welcome to Journeys and Journals. I'm Bernie Martin Beck and I get to talk to people around Southern Oregon, Northern California about history. Stories that maybe haven't been written, certainly not in their own words. My guest again is Daryl Bell and I want to thank you for coming all That's the quite way all, right. all the way over the hill, right? Yep. That hill's called Sexton? Mount Sexton, yes. Mount Sexton. Yeah. Now, that must have been a tough place to make on horse and buggy, right? It was a tough climb for horses, yeah. And oxen, you know, they the wagon trains, most of them had to stop at the foot of the mountain, you know, and they'd take three or four teams and put them on a wagon and pull it to the top and then come back down with the teams and get another wagon, take them up one at a time until they got them all at the top. Next time, folks, you drive an I-5, remember what Daryl said, because that incline would take several teams, yeah. and then to come down the other side, because it's steep too. Yeah. They'd put some horses in the... Well, they had several different ways. Most of the wagons had wooden brake blocks on them, you know. Right. And, and which our wagons still have, and which me and the kid that helped me, we still build wooden brake blocks for wagons if we have got a wagon that needs them. <laughs> now, and, you, you tell me where you're working. Well, I'm not anymore. I kind of give up the work, but we did do that. Okay, but but you are a volunteer. I call that work. Oh, yeah, I work. volunteer to, to talk and tell stories and keep company in, <laughs> but the work end of it, I've kind of got away from I, I got I just do things that don't require work but keep me busy and occupied and hobbies and well uh, and I like to visit with people and uh, that's the truth and when we have like tour buses especially come over to Old Town Hall why they always want me to tell a story of some kind you know so well I'd like you to tell us one of those stories right now well, okay, I'll tell you the story that I tell the, the people all the time because it's always a different bus so I can use the same old story. <laughs> <laughs> you bet. But we talked about before about this, uh, about the, the whiskey and the moonshine, you know, was a great thing out there. It was uh, uh, next to gold. It was probably one of the best paying things in the <laughs> country. But, and. And there's a family out there, which there's a lot of descendants there yet, by the name of Kreitzer. And way back in the late teen, 1800s, one of the Kreitzers went by the name of Baldy Kreitzer. And, and old Baldy Kreitzer had a big still and, and made lots of moonshine and sold it to the miners. And uh, in fact, in, towards the tail end of his moonshine days, he even acquired a Josephine County license to sell moonshine legally, but he could only sell it in by the gallon jug. He couldn't sell it out by drink. So, of oh. course, mostly mm. bars, the, the saloons bought it, you know, and, but some miners that could afford it to buy a gallon. But, but anyhow, he had a still way back up in the canyon, and one day, uh, a re federal revenue man come to his house, knocked on the door, and his little 10-year-old kid went to the door. And, uh, and he told him, he said, uh, I'm a federal revenue man. And he said, I look for people that have stills, make whiskey and moonshine. If I find them, he said, I put them in jail. And he said, uh, I understand your dad has one and makes whiskey, and, uh, moonshine. The little kid said, that's right. Well, he said, is your dad home? He said, no, he's up back up the draw there where he still is making some moonshine right now. Well, he said, is your mother here? She said, no, she's up there jugging it off for him. And he said, well, I'll tell you what. He said, I'll give you $5 if you'll take me up there where they're at. Well, the little kid had never seen a $5 bill, you know, and he said, well, sure, I'll do that. So he got his coat on and come out in the porch and and the revenue man said, well, let's go. And the little kid said, well, give me the $5. And the revenue man said, no, I'll give you the five when we get back. And the little kid said, no, no, you've got to give me the five now. 
And the revenue man said, well, why can't I give you the five when we get back? The little kid says, because you ain't coming back. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the story I tell the, the, uh, the tour buses. It don't work for the kids, you know, but. Well. And I got an old still, an old copper still that was found in an old mine shack up Bear Gulch. And it's the big old tall thing. It's all copper, battered, beat. It's hard looker, but and it's got the old copper coils and everything. And I got an old crock jug, and I put the spout down in that and set it up there oh, when I like tell the story. Oh, like as if it and was it's, real. It's a real thing, you know. It don't work anymore, but in its day it did. Well, now, one way up the creek is down Placer. the creek. Placer. And the other way down is Leland. And Placer and Leland were much more important than Oh, yeah, lots bigger. Than uh, Grants yeah. Pass, or I think Leland at one time had around 1,200 people in it, but but it wasn't called Leland then; it was called Altamont. Okay. Yeah. But and Leland was a pretty important spot, wasn't it? Yeah, because the Southern Pacific come through there, and, and so and, you, and the railroad, and they was building the railroad through there, and and they had uh, I think they had about two blacksmith shops and probably three saloons and a couple of grocery stores and a couple of hotels. And, and they kept coming this way with the railroad, you know, going through with the railroad. Right. And uh, they were, you know, headed south with it and got as far as Ashland and then it stood still there for quite a while. And they got as far as Wairika with it and it stood still there quite a while because it took them a long time to tunnel through the Siskiyou oh, before they could go man. build that it all the way hard rock yeah and and when they finally got a tunnel through there and opened up and and the first train come into Wairika and but they hadn't got the tunnel through yet but they got as far as Wairika and when the first train come into Wairika so many people in the Rogue River Valley wanted to see a train they'd never seen one and and they got up uh, stagecoaches in Ashland ah! to take them down and I forget I think it took about 24 stagecoaches to take the people all down uh, w from Ashland it was a two-day trip to Wairika see and and my granddad drove one of the stagecoaches so you know this to be true oh yeah Every my granddad told me all about it oh and, and, and he yeah he was a teamster and he he used to do a lot of I have pictures of him grading the streets of talent for the for the county with a horse drawn his horse drawn grader. Yeah, what did they call those uh, graders? Special it, name. It, just, it was called a grader it, then, but it was horse drawn. It wasn't. It didn't have any gas power. He worked. No engine, no nothing. Just those. Worked four head of horses on it. Oh. And, and it took two guys because one had to turn the wheels at raise the blade up and down right. or angle it or whatever and one guy had to no. drive the horses do that for the horses yeah. well you've got so yeah. many stories and i before we just move too far away i want to talk about your dream for this 20th century museum what well, is for radio park you mean radio park well you know a lot of that's still up to the curator and I don't know. He's he's gone over. Well, I'm sure a lot of the artifacts that we have, you know, and then of course he'll choose what he wants to use, and and we thought in one section of it, we we can't call it we, we can't call it Radio Park nothing anymore. I'm afraid because it would make people think that probably antique radio is all we had. It's actually going to be called the Southern Oregon Museum of Country Living. That'll be oh, the name. Okay. And in one portion of it, I I think they plan to feature one of the displays, uh, a small section that would be like the old Radio Park store. Oh, that'll be fun. In fact, uh, when we when we restored the building, I took down the old Radio Park sign and saved it and saved it uh, and it had a big old cannonball the wood heater in it and the, some people took it but i had a dead mate to it myself put away so i still got a heater just like it to oh, put in there <laughs> oh wonderful well now you've got a parking lot yeah when i was out there one time here they're hauling in 
Um, grinding, as we call them. Okay. Where did the grindings come well, from? We've got them from several different places over the years. That when they repave Mount Sexton the last time, they, they have this big machine that tears up the old paving. Right. And, and it just chews it all up fine, and it comes out looking just like paving that you'd be putting back down. Right. And and they have to dispose of it. And normally they have to dispose of it someplace close because they're they the well, machine is like six hundred dollars an hour, so they can't tie it up. Right. And, and like I, I one time I got I had about eight big twenty yard dump trucks hauling grindings right into the museum down there and we made a huge the whole parking lot for that. And then this last time that we got them is they built the rebuilt the two bridges across Graves Creek down there on the freeway. Right. And to not shut down traffic, the distance between the two bridges was the width of four lanes of traffic. So they put a big culvert in there, filled it, and then paved on top and and put all the traffic through there while they were rebuilding the bridges. Then when they got done, they had to tear it all back out. So and first come the grindings, and, and then come about 280 loads of black shale, which is real good to make parking lots out of or anything. And, and they hauled it all and give it to us, and we made a big parking area down below the store, and we have about 140 loads put away to use when we need them, and then there was quite a bit of grinding, so I enlarged the parking lot in front of Radio Park and put a new, pretty good sized one in the back of Radio Park, up on the, in back of it. Do you believe in recycling, folks? I sure do, and mm. and everything about that museum. See, when they, and, and you can go right up, you'd be going right up old Highway 99 and turn into the parking lot, and then there's a ditch across the upper end there that was hand dug by Chinaman years ago, and it started way up Graves Creek and took water out of Graves Creek and went down, clear down to run the steam beer mine for water for the steam beer mine. And over the years, that ditch has all got obliterated from civilization, farming, log and whatnot. But the section full length of Radio Park is still in good shape. And I see to it that it's kept in good shape and I even have a deed to that ditch from 1894. Oh my, yeah. I, I was lucky enough to go there when this was all being worked on. Yeah. They were bringing in loads. Can you imagine how much it saved the government not having to haul that into some dump someplace or? Oh yeah. I mean, it was right there. Yeah. You said, yes, we'll accept it. Yeah. And they were good, you know, they furnished this cats with blades on them, graders, water trucks, with, it's been rolled and watered and leveled and, but, but it was just a, uh, well, the wildish construction company from Eugene was the ones that done the work and, and they put an office trailer right in the, our parking lot of the store and, so you s and oh. stayed right there. So you I, I, I've dealt with all of them, you know, from day one that they done all these construction things. I'm out there talking my head off just to <laughs> <laughs> keep them good. And the yeah. time that I had them big dump trucks hauling off of Mount Sexton, I stayed down there myself and I had a ice chest full of all kinds of, of soft drinks, you know, and another one with all kinds of candy bars. And, and ever so often if a, when the truck Empty as a load and headed back to get another. I'd holler, "What you know? He don't. Do you want a coke or a candy bar or pop?" They did. They always <laughs> did. And I stayed down there and it's passed cool. out the, <laughs> that just uh, for goodwill. You know, they guys I'd appreciated say, it. it. Was hot and you know. And, I'd say that's a thank you. Yeah, and uh, it was a thank you from Betty to and you know to get her lot all done and well, she furnished it all. Betty's been an incredible resource to. Yeah. Now, you have the store across the way, right? Where you can get buffalo yeah. burgers and... And the service station. And then on your side of I-5, 
there's this wonderful store and I found you yeah. in that store. Oh yeah, I, that's my hangout, I guess you'd call it. Betty and I put the store in originally together, oh gosh, 20, 25, 26, seven years ago, I guess. But uh, but in later years, I, or not, well, not later years, not too long after we started, I sold her my interest in the store. Well. Because, uh, well, when we first done it, I was, of course, younger, and I was in the auction business in town, and and I was geared up to do everything fast, you know, and it was a little slow for me, and I didn't care that much about it, so I sold her my interest, but she had, had helped me many years in the auction business, and so when I sold out the auction, I just was helping her back, and of course, now that uh, I'm older in the hills and all mellowed out, <laughs> I guess you'd call it, <laughs> I, I enjoy sitting around the store and seeing everybody I've yacked at for years and oh. little kids, uh, you know, they're, I've got kids that come in that have ki that I waited on when they were learning to walk and now they're leading their own kids in. See? And saying, yeah. Daryl, tell them <laughs> stories. Tell them stories like you used to tell us. Huh? And they, oh, the want, kid. they want your kids. Oh yeah, their well, kids. we're getting geared up now for Christmas for them and then I have a, uh, there's a, a, a club deal here in town. It used to be called Capture Us. And, and it's ladies, retired ladies, and they knit. And, and they knit stocking caps all summer long. And they always bring me, the lady stopped by the other day. She says, I always remember Daryl and Betty in this little country store. And she brought me two dozen stocking caps. And I, I put them away till about the middle of December and then I get them out and then I pass them out. They get them. They're all brand new yarn and really nicely done and different sizes. And we give them away free to the kids, you know. And out in Sunny Valley. Cold then. And what an incredible community project. So somebody gives the yarn and somebody does the knitting and yeah. somebody give Daryl gives them away. Yeah. Well, then and, and, and another thing that we've done, we haven't the last couple of years because they've They've done it over in Wolf Creek Park, but and they probably come, may come back over there this year, but it, we've done it for a lot of years there up in the back end of the property. I don't know if you ever noticed, but we have a big wooden cross and and they always have have sunrise services there at Easter time. Oh my. And well, I I'd... come, I, well, I have to get up at four o'clock in the morning and go down there and I build a fire in town hall and and then they bring all their Continental breakfast stuff, I call it, you know, donuts and pastries and fruit and stuff. And and then I have an old, big old five gallon lard kettle and I take it up there and build a fire on it right up by the cross and people all stand around because it's dark, you know, cold that time of year. Cold and dark, yeah. yes. And I have their sunrise service there. Then they come down to Old Town Hall and have their, and, and then we I make about Oh, I don't know, three or four gallons of coffee. We furnish and give the coffee. Well, that's a community for, center. Yeah, I that's just, their Easter thing. I just, um, if it's on this year, I'll be there. Yeah. I, <laughs> I've gone to one down out at Weimar. Yeah. I've been to the ones, different places when I hear about them over here on the east side of I-5 and out in Merlin, out on uh, the Rogue River. There's a sunrise service uh -huh. out there. Uh, you've told us about the the store, the store on the east side of I-5, right? Yeah. That's called what? Covered Bridge Country Store. So it is Covered Bridge. Uh -huh. And then? And we call the station Covered Bridge Station. And then on the other side of the freeway, Betty bought the corner over there that used to have the old mobile station on it and we all rebuilt that into the Applegate Trail Cafe. Now that cafe is where I had the buffalo burger. Right, and oh. she gets all her buffalo flowing in from Minnesota. Oh my! I don't know if you ever watched the movie Dancing with Wolves. Yeah. The big buffalo herd in that movie, well that buffalo herd is in Minnesota. And, but they, they, and they used them to, in the film but the herd actually is that they raise them for meat, you know. 
Yeah. So it's flowing into Medford, comes in and throws hard as a rock. We pick it up there and bring it over. And I've often wondered uh, why you don't have some buffalo grazing out in one of those pastures. You well, know? we thought about it, but I'll tell you, they're they're tough to keep in a fence. They they take oh, awful, they want to they want to roam. They do yeah, like yeah. Yeah, we've thought about it, but it, it's a. Uh, and another thing, you kind of got to know how the people do to handle them and stuff. They're at times all okay. And there used to be a buffalo ranch up by Glendale there. And the fellow that had them, one of the bu big old bulls killed him too. Oh. Yeah, so they can get. So that's not They're just not like running white-faced cattle or something. <laughs> they're a little different temperament. And, and uh, you know, in that movie, you see them like a whole herd. Oh, yeah. Uh, like, like a bulldozer. I mean, uh, yeah. great power and force coming yeah. at. Yeah. Well, they, they, you know, they mostly handle them by on horseback, you know, and well, also. You, you mentioned the big old lard bucket, but I brought one of these. Canner. Well, I don't think it really is. Or a double boiler. Yeah, I I think it's had some stew cooking in it. Yeah. Bill Young, my friend uh, from Better Life Television here, he, uh, this came out of camp gear, and when they had the auction, I said, oh, I need that real bad. This was out in their hunting gear. So I brought the red hat, and uh, they'd go off the guys to do hunting, I'm told that really it wasn't so important whether you got a deer or not. It was the chance to get away and act like Boy Scouts or something. Oh yeah, a lot of, a lot of I don't hunt myself, but a lot of people or men that, that hunt, I hear them say, well, I didn't get nothing, but I don't care, I, I had fun. You know, it was a trip with a few days off from work or whatever, and, and of course, the, in the old days before they had cattle here. Well, it was, hunting was serious business because that uh, that was how you eat. That was how you yeah, eat, even they, during the depression. And I've talked to a number of people who, yeah, uh, you know, in season and out of season, yeah, with antlers and without. Oh yeah. Well, and, and way if, back, of course, there wasn't a season. You if know, if you're real hungry. Yeah, and and what, even when I lived in Alaska, I killed. Uh, caribou and moose both myself and and I wasn't a trophy hunter either I was hungry I fed my family in the winter you know I I see that watch Bob dangling in front of you is it real is that a genuine authentic uh... yeah it's just a little watch Bob with some opals in it but one of them fell out oh you used to have a picture in it I had a picture of Betty and Jackie in it but they uh, got bad loose I took them out but uh, no, it's just a dangling thing on the old, old watch. Watch, yeah. I still, I don't even look at it anymore. It's too much easier to wear a wristwatch, but a pack that's so long, I feel like I'm not all there dressed if I don't have a, well, I, oh my. a watch on. There's, there. uh, there's the watch. Yeah. I'll just bet that many a train has been met using yeah. this watch. They're called a hunting case watch. Well, railroad had a lot of restrictions on a watch. Now they wouldn't, they, you couldn't use a hunting case watch. You had to have what they called an open face watch. You couldn't use Roman numerals. And some watches, the 12 was over here. A railroad watch, the 12 always had to be even with the stem. When they pulled it out of your pocket, they wanted you to look at it right. And, and right Otherwise you might smack a couple of trains head on. And, oh no. <laughs> yeah. And there was a train wreck uh, up in uh, your part of the world between Grants Pass and Sunny Valley. I hear yeah. the tunnel wasn't really very tall. Yeah, I don't, that last wreck wasn't, I think it was caused from a slide. Yeah, well this was a long time oh, ago. Oh, a long time ago, yeah. And they had. Well, the big tunnel wreck was up on the Siskiyous, you know. Well, it wasn't a wreck. They it got held up. Robbery. But the crazy one that's on your tunnel, they, they'd they say, well, that tunnel can only take X number of feet tall load. Right. But somebody didn't get out and measure it in time, and here came a big load through that tunnel and just 
clipped all these appliances. Boing, boing, oh, boing. Man. So then um, I think I have the Calcos to thank for that story. Yeah. They've been such a resource for me. Uh -huh. uh, here we are back with the covered, covered wagons. Now this is every in the summer. The first weekend of ever October. October. Yeah. October. Folks, if you wanted to live history, you might just stop by. Take your visiting uh, friends and neighbors on those. I'm yeah. glad to hear that. How yeah, well, I always have a, some local fellows there that play good music, you know, they're, they're playing and, and then generally uh, anywhere from around 400, 450 eat buffalo stew there. And storytellers, you had some storytellers yeah, from, people, from the Applegate that, family. They come and book different authors come, you know, and have what they call book signings, you know, and sell their book and then they'll autograph it for whoever buys and it. And such a character you had there, Harold Teague. He was telling stories about his grandpa. Yeah. My goodness, he's got a wonderful story about an Indian peace pipe that yeah. is in his possession. Yeah. Uh, you know, we're, we get these history stories thanks to you and men like you who are willing to share. Yeah. Do you have one more that you could tell us real quick about history in Sunny Valley? You already told us about that bridge. Yeah. It's, it's well worth driving across, folk. Well, one, one thing that uh, the, the, the old original store there many, many years ago stood over on the other side of what's the freeway now and the stage road come, the Applegate Trail and the stagecoach followed it too, right down through there. And, and there was an old man by the name of Pettengale had the store. Uh -huh. and, and he wrote daily diaries in a little book about, oh, they're about that long and that wide and a little hardback book and about that thick, just buying the paper in them. And he wrote every day in there what happened. And he'd say how one day he sold $30 worth of stuff. That was a big day for him. And well, he, he had to take it in gold. So and, we can come to your museum and learn a little bit about more about Mr. Pettengill. I got all of Mr. Pettengill's little books. Wonderful. Bet he has, but I, I found them and bought them and, and they're in the museum. She's, they're hers now to, and on display and well, and I, it tells every day what he did. And thank you ever so you much bet. for being my guest. And I'll just put on my hat and off we go. Okay. <laughs> Thanks for tuning in to Journeys and Journals. I'm Bernie Martin Beck saying goodbye. See you next week.